Well, thank you for staying with us. Uh, we kickstart uh, the conversation, the big stories this morning on the AM show by interacting with the opposition and a DC. And it has to do with the happenings over the last few days. Yes, we're going to be talking about the visit of Kamala Harris, the American vice president, but we're going to be focusing more on the NDC and what is happening within that party, what has happened within that party in recent times and what we can look forward uh, to from there. There's also the vetting of aspirants, which has been taking place over the last uh, few days. We're going to be getting further details on all of that. Joining us for that conversation, we have Fred Agbeño. He is Director of International Affairs uh, with the National Democratic Congress, the Deputy uh, Director of International Affairs with the National Democratic Congress. He joins the conversation. Mr. Agbeño. My brother. A very good morning to you. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay. How about you? I'm not okay. You're not okay? I yeah. can't be okay. In this economy, I cannot be okay, my brother. Uh, I usually say under the circumstances, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, we have to be optimistic. So, well, so we try. Well, I agree with you, but I don't think a lot of Ghanaians are okay at all. I don't mm. know what's happening around the country. Mm. What Ghanaians are going through, really, really, things are tough. Things are mm. difficult. Ghanaians are dying, I'm mm. telling my brother. We are, we, are, we are faithing it. We are faithing it before we actually feel it. And I was a. We, we, we can't conduct just be faithing it, you know. We are human. We're supposed to feel it. We're supposed to experience it. We're supposed mm. to touch and feel it. Mm. You know, we can't keep faith forever and ever. The Bible said, don't just tell a person, go in faith. At least provide something before you add the faith to it. So something mm. must come first. Then we can be talking about faith. But, but, but when, your, when your administration was in power and the former president, Mahama, there were times when things were not going so well. You wanted us to... Well, I, I, I thought that you were talking about this happening today and now. No yeah, other thing. Yeah, yes, yes, but I mean... But like, Ghanaians passed... Let's, let's, they, let's use the same benchmark. Ghanaians passed a verdict in 2016. Mm. Yes, we were told things were not good. We were told that people were suffering, nothing was going on in the country. And the Ghanaians passed a verdict on us. We've, and that uh, government has been in power for the past six, seven years. So let's focus on the now and leave the mm. past behind and proceed. Okay, since you mentioned the now, let me ask you, if, if you look at Ghana today, uh, there are definitely positives and there are some negatives. How would you assess the Ghana of today? Well, let me start off by saying good morning to our cherished viewers, especially my constituents. I don't know. We are a republic to ourselves, the people of uh, <laughs> one district. And uh, let me thank them for their tolerance in the face of all provocation, that as Ghanaians, the president and the MPP have decided to violate the constitution and uh, are being treated as though we are second citizens within our own country. Uh, we will keep on waiting patiently and believe that they will do the needful and uh, give us the right representation and constituency so that we can also see the development that others are supposed to be seeing. Um, my brother, coming back to the question you just asked, I'm not too sure if there are any positive that we can talk to uh, today as we speak. I don't are you know. saying it's all negative in Ghana? Well, maybe you can point to a few of the positive that we can discuss them, but from where I sit, I'm not too sure if there are any policies out there, if you look at the revenue, the resources that we have gained as a nation, the money that have come to our country, vis-a-vis -vis what you want to call development, that is available for us to see, I think that we, we can't help but to agree that our country is moving in the negative direction. Nothing is moving the country at all. There are no positive. Let's take almost all the sectors one by one. Go to the educational sector as we speak today. SS, uh, the first year students are supposed to be in school. I just read in the news, GSC self saying that majority of them are selling the house. Mm. And find out why the reason is parents cannot afford to just provide to meet the, the, the demands of the prospectus that has been issued by uh, various institutions. Did you Very, say a majority of them? That is what GSC is saying. The majority sure. of them? Yeah, the majority of the students are in the house. I don't know how they came by that. Mm. Maybe they have because to. Because that's, that's pretty data. surprising. Yes, but that's what is, I know. Yes. I, I monitored the news this morning as I was working in here, and they are saying that. Majority of the students are in the house. And they even went for that to say that it's becoming a trend. When school reopens, they don't go to school early. Mm. And I am telling you, because I've been there constantly for some time now, interacting with people. And every day, parents are knocking at your door. They are looking for that 4,000 Ghana cities to be able to buy their things on a prospectus. They are looking for 3,500 cities. And not many of them can afford that. Mm. And so if indeed we say we are providing free education, these are the things that you, you, you want to tackle first. Because a child cannot go to school with those, without those basic things. And some way, somehow, we have found a back door to introduce the fees back onto uh, the, the, the prospectors. And nobody talks about it. As parents who have their walls in school, they have to be sending money almost every week, every day, for the kids uh, to, to get something to eat. Some of the schools provide porridge for breakfast, for lunch. 
and dinner the children are left, left on their own. And so nothing really is going on in that sector. It comes to the health sector. Not too long ago, we were told that even vaccines for infants has become a major problem in this country, right? Just vaccines over here, we couldn't procure. We have to go to Nigeria and the rest, you know, begging them to be able to give us some support. We have told, we have taken some delivery. I'm not too sure it has gone around all the hospitals in the country. If that's not, government will need to expedite uh, some access on that. You know, go to our hospitals and find out what is happening today, my brother. It is so, so uh, pathetic. The rains have just started coming in and just drive around our roads. I'm not talking about the countryside, just here in Accra. You know, go outside the, 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 main, the main city of Accra and see the type of roads that we have. You know, we, 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 I don't know the contractors who worked on the road. I don't know who supervised them. Spend millions of dollars in some cases to construct a road and the road cannot last beyond six months. And that is the current state of our roads. You know, if you go to my, my, my district in the Guan district, you can't mention of one single motorable road in the entire district. You know, it's so terrible. If you drive from where you're coming to Accra, the road is so terrible. The whole road is terrible. Almost every road. So meanwhile, the minister and the president is telling us that they are investing so much in that sector. We want to see evidence of that investment. We want to see how that impacts on the lives of the citizens of this country. But I'm not too sure uh, there's anything that we can speak to. Go to the agriculture sector. I'm not too sure what is happening in that sector today. Uh, you have been sending your cameras around the market and price of food is going up by the day. You know, go and check the, the inflation, the food inflation is just going up every day. And so really, if you take it sector by sector, my brother, I don't think that uh, we are heading the right direction. Uh, Ghana is going uh, the, the reverse way. And so some actions need to be taken if indeed we have to come out of the current quagmire which we find ourselves. Let me just ask you this. So you, you paint a dire picture, but there's, it's not possible anywhere in the world to have an administration that has performed so abysmally that everything is negative. Yes, I can agree with you when you speak on the economy. I can agree with you when you touch on inflation and all of that. But there's free SHS, even regardless of all its ills, it is in there helping the masses. You look at the roads that the president touts that have been uh, constructed. We can have our own discussions on whether it's the reality of uh, having you know, constructed the most roads in the Fourth Republic or not, but something has been done there. You look at Agenda 111, which may not have yielded the 111 uh, hospital facilities yet, but is in the offing. You can talk about education and the STEM schools. You can talk about 1D1F, no matter how few the factories are, juxtaposed with the over 100 that are touted. You can talk about cocoa yields in agriculture and all of that. Are you saying these are nothing? I mean, uh, the politics, yes, we, we, we get to the point where we'll always want to put ourselves in front. But is that the reality, that nothing is working in Ghana? You see, my brother, as for the slogans, we can all go ahead and just... No, no, I'm not talking, I'm not sloganeering. I'm talking no, no, about... No, that is, you have mentioned. Reality, some, some of those. We have problems with all of these, but there's something that Practically, is being... how are this impacting on the citizens of this country? This is a government that came into office, and our total death from Musaibu Dakota days to John Dramani Mahama was $120 million, billion. Mm. Today, as we speak, our debt is almost over 500 billion. You Look know how it, much it, more money they have added. Mm. And so you ask yourself, what can we see tangibly that this money that we have gotten, this is what we did with it. We were in this country, COVID, when COVID came, mm. all the money that came into our economy, i.e. the World Bank, i.e. the, the uh, IMF, corporate Ghana, and what have you. If you put everything together, close to 35 billion Ghana cities. The president himself said they spent about 17 billion, 19 billion in some case. The minister has given another figure. The president given us another figure. So let's even assume that they spent even 19 billion of that. Go and check the tax revenue that came in between 2019, 2020, and 2021. From 41 billion Ghana cities to 42 billion cities. If at 2020, 2020, 2021, that COVID was supposed to have, you know, struck in this country, the revenue that we generated from the taxes alone was almost for the, uh, for the uh, uh, 4 billion Ghana cities. So if you are looking at what they said they have done, you have to just oppose that against the revenue that has come into their hands. Question is, looking at the money that has come to this government and the things that you just mentioned, is that what we deserve as a people? Is that prudent management of our economy and our resources? Look at the oil revenue that has come into this country within the past six, seven years. And so this government has received so much money, and that if they are good managers of the economy, if they had put corruption aside and wastage aside, Ghana shouldn't be where we are today. 
And so we can't be talking about agenda 111 when almost everywhere you pass, they are at the foundation level. They've just done something, used some roofing sheet to, to fence a, around some land. Nothing tangible is going on over there. Recently, I think I saw the uh, Select Committee on uh, Health or so from Parliament that took some media men around some of these sites. And we all saw the pictures. You know, nothing good to write home about. Nothing really is happening on the ground. You know, these so-called uh, 1D1 uh, factories, I don't know, there's no factory in my district that I can point to. I don't know which is, which is your district, if you have any factory over there. Again, is it enough to say we have built a factory? Question is, what is the impact? How many people have been employed? How has that party transformed the lives of the people who live, especially within that catchment area? For me, those are the germane questions that we should be speaking to. It's not enough to just say, well, we have built factories. You know, the free SHS, you said it's helping a lot of people. I have said that as a nation, looking at the resources that we have, it will not be wrong if we decide to educate all Ghanaian children for free. Indeed, if you go and check in the constitution, that was written several years ago. It made provision for providing free education, you know, depending on availability of resources. This free SHS, my brother, are you comfortable to want to send your child to what you have right now? And I've always argued that if you go to a basic school, government basic school, primary schools and what have you, the schools are said to be free. How come that the average Ghanaian still wants to take their children to uh, pretty schools and go and pay more money? Because the perception is that we are not getting the best from government basic schools. And everybody wants the best for their awards. And mm -hmm. so they take them to a uh, pretty school and go and pay money. Mm -hmm. I am saying that in a few years to come, not many people will be willing to take their children to government secondary schools. Because what you are seeing today, so my son goes to a secondary school, he left home on the 10th of January, SS2, right? Mm -hmm. He goes to school. On the 17th of February, barely a month, the child was back home. Why? They said the first year students are coming in and there's no space to accommodate them. So the second year to come and stay in the house. Mm -hmm. Now they are home, you have to go and look for a private school for them. Everybody, every day wakes up in the morning, you give him TNT, you give him feeding, you pay for that, the teaching. If you put all those money, of course, yes, I am a parent. If you put those monies together, it is fine, except what we're paying when the so-called free SHS didn't exist. And so where are we? If you tell me it is impacting on us, if we are benefiting from it, I can see. I find that every day. I, I, I find that interesting because your 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 former um, you know presidential candidate has said that free SHS is not going to be scrapped. So so what are you guys going to do with it then? Nobody says we should scrap it. We are saying that we should do it well. Mm. So Ghanaians come. So you you, you you would do it differently. Brother, of course, yes. Right. We started the progressive free SHS. We are saying that this is a policy we need to sit down and thoroughly think through it, get all the stakeholders to come on board, and let's see how we can fashion it. Like the finance minister himself said, a whole finance minister of Ghana, mm. making so much money. If he can afford to pay his children's school fees in Natimota school, why do you ask a poor taxpayer to pay for it? If I, for like, can, can pay for my children's school fees, why do you ask me to pay for it? If you're a government that is really want to solve a problem, what you would have done is to first start rolling this program in the villages. Mm. Roll the free SHS in the villages, what you succeed in doing by doing so is that you even decongest the national capital and the cities. Mm. That everybody who goes to a village, so to speak, a village career school, you get that for free. If you said you want to go to Achimota school, you want to go to Presec, you want to go to all these, you know, the first class schools, then you must be ready to pay for it. You know, so nobody has put a gun to get the president's head to say, implement this policy. But what we are seeing today, we are, the education is deteriorating so badly that in a few years to come, all of us will come around this same table and say, no, the decision we took was a wrong decision. I do agree that uh, we must have some consensus, maybe involving the two major political parties in the country as well, on our education. We've moved from three years to four years, back to three years, and all of these things. I, I feel we need some clarity. But just a point you made that I want to clarify. Are you aware that at a point in time in the previous administration, just as we are talking now about this current administration adding to the debt stock beyond all the previous governments in the past. Do you know, during the tenure of uh, former President Mahama as well, that was, that was the same situation. Are you aware of that? Or, she, or should I give you the facts? No, no I'm not going to argue on that. You, okay, you can so, compare apples and stones. Really? John Mahama borrowed money. Right. Question is, is there any evidence as to what that money was put to? Mm. So I can just close my eyes mm. and point my, 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 my finger towards circle here. The right. interchange is there for you to see. Mm. I can point to the, uh, the rich hospital. 
which is now called the Greater Accra Hospital. It is there for you to see. Greater Accra I can Greater point Greater to Hospital. the original hospital. I can point to the University of Ghana uh, 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 Hospital. I can point to the Dodowa Hospital. I can point to several hospitals across the country. Go to Western, uh, uh, Upper West Regional Hospital, Upper East Regional Hospitals. I can mention uh, Terminal 3 in Accra here. I can mention uh, Kumase uh, Airport. I can mention Tamale Airport. I can mention Ho Airport. I can mention, go to Tema Port. You know, the new port that was built, which is five times bigger than the original port. Go to Takrade Port. So evidence is there that the man that was borrowed was used for infrastructure development for the benefit of the society. Right. The number so, of schools that were built, mm. the number of road infrastructure, and everything is there. Question is, you have borrowed over 400 billion Ghana cities. What have you used the money for? And that's why we're going to consumption. Go and check the budget auditor general's report on this uh, 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 COVID. Look at how our money was spent mm. in the name of feeding people in Accra and Kaswa and just Tema. Look at the, 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 the budget. The so-called spraying of schools for schools to reopen. Look at the budget. And so they have just come to a mass wealth. They were borrowing because the finance minister, who is a president cousin, was benefiting from the, benefit from the borrowing. And was building a financial that, empire. That, 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 that is not a point that, but that you is can, the truth. You can, you is can it not? categorically say. Yes, oh, we, have, we have uh, those entities that are, uh -huh. so to speak, book runners, for, for lack of a better word. But you cannot say that they were borrowing. I did not benefit. But, but let, me just, let me just go to those things. <laughs> what so, debt could be the most Between 2000 and 2008, right before we get into the NDC and, and matters arising, under President Okufor, uh, the, the amount added to the debt stock was 4.82 billion uh, Ghana cities in those days, if you do the conversion, uh, bringing our total debt to 9.7 billion at the time when Kufour exited in 2008. Then came NDC and uh, JEA Mills, 2009 to 2012. And of course, we know of the dynamics in there. But the total we added to our debt stock then was 26.25 billion Ghana cities, bringing our debt stock to 36 billion. Enter J.D. Mahama. He also added 86.17 billion Ghana cities. In fact, if you do the math, 26 billion plus uh, 4 billion, so 26 billion under Atamil's stroke uh, Mahama at the, the 4 billion, that's just about 31 billion that was added. But within that administration alone, that window from 2013 to 2016, 86.17 billion was added, which would be more than we had borrowed since independence. But you come to this current administration and, of course, a whopping figure of 453.5 billion, and counting, has been added to our debt stock, bringing us into the region of 600 billion. In fact, around 575.7 billion Ghana CD. So all of this talk can go on and we can uh, I really say would. all the things uh, we, we would. I, I'm not disputing what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, but I really would. I'm not even doing this infrastructure. In place, right? I, I I'm merely saying, I'm merely saying mm. that in terms mm. of, if you're just looking at it, in terms of what has been accrued, what has been added on, both of you would have issues. But when it comes to what the resources have been used for, which technically is what, is what, is what counts mm. in the end. Of course. Because, of course. like we know, the United States has debt of trillions of dollars. That's true. Yet, what does it use Don't the money go there for? The evidence. What is the sustainability That's right. in terms of its economy? So That's I get right. your point. I was just putting that out there in terms of the bare facts. But I'd like to find out, what is the temperature currently? In the NDC. Those questions were just by the by because you started talking about the reality of the ordinary Ghanaian today. What is the temperature in the NDC currently? How hot is it on the back of what happened last Friday? Your members of parliament disappointed you and disappointed many Ghanaians along the way. On social media, we saw the effect, we saw the talk. Franklin Kujo, you know, of Imani Africa, took you guys on and said that, in fact, suggesting in his tweet that. 2024 was slipping away and that what the people want, you are not delivering. But your own people, Dr. Clementa Park, uh, you know, my, my good friend, went on social media, uh, literally, you know, handing those people over to God who had betrayed the cause. We saw your party's general secretary, Fifi Fiavi uh start with a roll call of those who had uh, voted this way uh, without showing those who had not voted a certain way. The former president, Mahama, described some of them as, in fact, described them as traitors. Together with Fifi Kwete, before he backtracked and said that, but let's not victimize them. We're still going to need them in parliament. Let's forge ahead as one body. 
what is the temperature like in, in the NDC? And are you mending the cracks? Well, I can tell you for a fact that the, the rank of file of our party people are not happy. Uh, with what happened in Parliament on Friday, uh, I have been on the ground, I have been interacting with our branch executives, and almost every community I visited after Friday, uh, everybody threw this issue at me. And what is happening? What is happening with leadership? Why did you allow this to happen? And to be very honest with you, our party people felt betrayed, they felt let down. Uh, that was not their expectation. And I must say that what happened in Parliament on Friday was not just limited to just the NDC, but the generality of the Ghanaian people. Because long before that particular decision to pass the six uh, ministers was passed, we have heard, including even some foreign nationals, have heard the ambassador to Germany also has also made some comments about the size of uh, government and thought that the size of government is too huge, you need to do something about it. I've heard civil society organizations, I've heard people in the media, everybody is complaining about it. And so when NDC took a principal position that no, we are not going to allow the six ministers to pass and that President Akufuado must do something about the size of government, I thought that we had a very rare opportunity to have, you know, compel the president to do the needful. Unfortunately, not all our members of parliament, uh, just about some 30 or 40 of them, decided to betray the principal position that we took. And I thought that that was most, 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 most unfortunate. What do you feel accounted because for that? I, I am not too sure and I don't intend to speculate. I have read a few things that people have put out. I've, I've heard what people have said. People, some people believe that uh, some monies might have, uh, you know, been given to some people. I don't have any evidence to that effect, and so I'm unable to speak to it. But, you see, if you are a Democrat, and you belong to an organization, and the organization has taken a decision, it's incumbent on you to respect and stand by that decision, regardless of your personal view of how to think about it. At the time before the decision is taken, everybody has a right to come and express an opinion and what they think must, must be done. But once a decision is taken, all of us are under that obligation to respect that decision. And so for you to go to parliament and go and do otherwise. Because if you recall, before this particular uh, 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 decision was taken in parliament, our party general secretary had issued an official statement asking all parliamentarians, or all MPs, to return to the house those who are traveling abroad to return back home, nobody's going to that country, they're going to campaign, and even halted campaign activities in their constituencies so they can stay in parliament and make sure that this decision we have taken as a party comes to light, that we don't approve of those ministers. And so for some of them to have gone there and go against this decision of the party, for me, is most, most, most regrettable. It's unacceptable. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't help the cause of the party. And there was a question somebody... Let me ask you a question right before you go on. Uh, these members of parliament, and, and I do agree that there are whipping systems across the world and all of that, but these members of parliament, they are not robots, you know that. They are not, but they are not representing <laughs> themselves. And, and whatever the case may be, while I personally have my own concerns about some of the nominees and maybe some things that went through and the numbers mm. Mm. who are ministers currently, I have my own concerns and I've said a time without number. But at the same time... These are not androids. They are I not agree. robots. I agree. And if they feel mm. their conscience guides them in a certain direction, of course, uh, having engaged their own constituencies because they reflect these constituencies, uh, can the party issue such directives? And some have called into question the fact that the Asidun Ketias and the Fifi Fiaviquetes would say, vote a certain way. That, in fact, you created this mess for yourself by trying to tie FETA your members of parliament. I, I, I don't think that we, we try to tie the hands of members of parliament as a political party. I don't think that there's anybody who is on the side of NDC who is just an independent candidate. First and foremost, you are there on the ticket of NDC. It is the NDC that gives you the platform on which you campaign and you want in parliament. Mm. You are once, once, once they get into parliament, you are they are there at the behest of the people they represent, right? So are you suggesting that the decision that they took, those who voted against the decision, it's what the, the, the conscience wants them to do. I'm not necessarily because saying that. We have I'm saying that it could be. It cannot be because we have spoken to almost every constituency and nobody seems to be happy with this. Mm. There's no single constituency that we are holding today that you go there that will tell you they are happy with what has happened in parliament. Everybody's angry. Right. Everybody's not happy. So it tells me clearly that the decision by those 38 or 40 MPs was their personal decision, which in this case shouldn't be the case. 
Because the party has taken a decision. Their conscience has taken a decision that the size of government is just too huge. We need to do something about it. And this has presented us an opportunity. So please, let's see how we can exploit that opportunity. You know, it's not as if we are asking them to do anything against their, their, their conscience. In any case, when the statement was issued by the general secretary of the party, if you have a contrary view, you have your, your leadership in parliament as well. Why didn't you go to them and tell them, you know what, this directive has been issued by, by, by the party, but we disagree with the party on this directive. We want to do A, B, C, D. So now we can invite to go and sit around the table and discuss and have an uh, amicable... Why, why, why would they do that when there's a whipping system and when, when there are likely consequences? I mean, whether you're looking at the NDC or the MPP, even look at the MPP caucus, those 80-plus uh, members of parliament who stood against Ken Oforiata and called for his... Removal. That's right. Uh, you heard some of the rhetoric around mm. that. Mm. You heard some of the comments, mm. uh, you know, even intimidating mm. comments suggesting mm. that, you know what, you keep up with this, when you go for the primaries, you're going to be losing. You know, some stalwarts in the party are going to be standing against you. It's a political game. Let's face it. And, I, and I, all of you play it. I'm saying that. See, these 38 or 40 people voted against the party's decision. Trust me, if their names come to the fore, all of them will lose their parliamentary seats. Trust me. They all of them. them? All of them. How can you guarantee that? See, I have been on the ground. I have been engaging our people. You've been reading around the social media. You, they call into radio stations. And the anger down there, the people are simply not happy. Because that is not what they want from their members of parliament. That is not what they want. See, I went to a village. I think I went to Lolobi Kumanse. Uh, on Sunday evening. So I went to interact with the people. Our coordinator there, Comrade uh, Peter, got up and asked me, so if you people are saying that our pooling agents should live above board, they should not allow themselves to be compromised by anybody, make sure that they stand there and defend the party at all costs. And they do these things even at the period of their lives. And then you members of parliament, can go and sit in parliament and compromise. What signal are you sending to the police agents? What are you telling them? And so this is not an issue we can just sweep under the carpet. This is not an issue we can just trivialize and make look as though it's one of those things. I wasn't able to attend FEC meeting yesterday. I arrived at this door. I got to around 2 a.m. this morning. I'm not too sure the signal was taken at FEC. But my view will be that the party should institute an investigation into this particular issue. We need to get to the bottom of it. We need to know the persons who were involved, the people who violated the party's uh, 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 directive, so that at least some sanctions and punishment is meted out to them to serve as a deterrent that when the party has whipped all of you in a particular direction and leadership has been formed to do so, you must comply. Because we so are, you, we are you, not you, you must comply us. even if your conscience. Working. You must comply even if your conscience tells you that decision. Your, your, is not your right. personal conscience is not above the general conscience. That is why you are not an independent. Uh, you are not an independent. Do you remember? Do you remember? Right before I bring in Professor uh, John Gachi, who has joined us, uh, Prof. A very good morning to you. Let me just say good morning to you, sir. Hello, Prof. Hello, Professor Gachi. Good morning. Gachi. Good morning. Good morning. Th thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Just, just hold for me for about a minute. I'll be with you uh, shortly. So, so you're thank basically you. saying that uh, these people should vote willy-nilly according to party lines. Do you remember the Fomena MP's uh, situation? Prof, just hold for me. Do you remember the Fomena yeah. MP, who is that's, now second deputy speaker? That's right. You remember the rhetoric? That's right. And uh, the party will not associate with him, and people should not. Today, hmm, you, see, you see what happened. But... So, it, so in, technically, what you're, what you're saying mm. is that the NDC failed in Parliament. You failed to control your ranks. You failed to marshal the forces to do the bidding of the party. It technically means that you don't have it all together, do you? No, I, I disagree with you. I think that we need to commend the leadership of the party in Parliament. They did their very best. Uh, it was secret voting. Nobody stood in the ballot box, uh, in, the, in the box with them, and they went there and decided to do what they did. Uh, whatever the constitution was, is left to their own conscience. But as I said, we need to be able to investigate this issue. We need to get to the bottom of it. You see, we might not say that in the name of politics, we can just behave anyhow and do things anyhow. We must be seen to be people who have some principle, people who have some values that we can hold on to. And so 
like example, you rightly cited in the Formula MPs case. We heard even the president himself who made several exactly after. You know, so where is the principal position? If you as a sitting president who think that people must trust you, you went to Formina, you looked at people in the face and said, this gentleman doesn't respect you, you are not going to deal with him, he's on his own, blah, blah, blah. The man comes back, you do a U turn now, go virtually apologizing to him, begging him, and making him a deputy uh, uh, you know, uh, speaker. So where's your principle? How is that different from what you are doing? What, what your, have we done? Your, your we party's have... flag bearer in the last election mm -hmm. called them traitors. And next thing he said later on was, but let's not victimize them. Let's, you are saying, let's fi no, no, no. You are saying, let's fish them out That's and right. punish them. That's right. Deal with them. That's right. And you are even suggesting that, look, come the next election, if we know who they are, they are all going to lose in their constituency. That is a sentiment. That's, that that's almost the threat you that are That is a sentiment that people on the ground. But your former uh, presidential candidate now, he, after calling them traitors, he says, let's that work with them. We need them. We need them in, uh, you know, parliament to push our agenda and all of that. If, if you say that was hypocrisy, then what is this? No, this was hypocrisy. He's saying that it was a, their action was a total betrayer. Mm. Yes, but you can't throw them away. Mm. The party can decide to investigate as I said and punish them, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to work with them. As long as they remain in parliament, we're still going to work with them. We can't ask them to resign and block and go and sit in the house. They are going to be there to the end of this uh, particular parliament. And so we need them. It's an egg and chicken situation. You need to balance it. But that doesn't mean that if your child misbehaves in the house and you take a kid and then you, 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 you flog him, that doesn't mean you hate your child. That doesn't mean you want to kill the child. That doesn't mean you want to throw the child away. So he's saying that their behavior amounts to a betrayer. Nonetheless, we need to manage the situation because we are still going to work with them for the next one and a half years plus. I, I, told, I asked you about failure. And, and after this, I promise I'll go back to prom. Mm. I asked you about whether... Uh, your caucus had failed, uh, even failing Ghanaians at large, those who may have wanted I, 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 I oh, Hold believe. on, hold on. Certain things to mm. be done. Mm. Tying it to this, is your party's leadership, administrative leadership, I'm talking about the chairman, general secretary and others who came out with these statements, and the parliamentary leadership, are they losing their grip on goings on? Because obviously, if you're saying the party should comply in parliament and you issue a directive, and that directive is roundly rejected by over 30 members of parliament. That no. can't be good. If one of the six people went into an election and some 30, as you just mentioned, decided to do otherwise, you can't not say it's a round. That's, that's, that's more you than, know. I said roundly rejected by over 30 of yes, members. Yes, but, that, but. That's over a third of your members of parliament. Less than a third. Over a third is six. That's about 30. a third of your members in parliament. I agree that what happened was unacceptable. And I cannot say that the party is losing control over them. It was, I said, it's a, a democratic system. They're voting, they went there to do it independently. Nobody was in the box with them. If you remember that very day, the national chairman of our party was in parliament the whole day. He sat in the lobby to watch whatever that was going over there. The leadership met their people. Because long before even the voting, my understanding is that one MPP person has said that, oh, we have got about 40 of your people already. And some names even came up. So they approached them. Who said that? Them. That is, I, I read it on one of the, this and that uh, one, they didn't mention the name of the, the person who said it. If, I don't even know if it is true. That, oh, we have bought 40 of your people already. And then some names even started dropping. And so they approached them, they spoke to them. So NDC they, MPs they, are for sale? I, I didn't say that. And I cannot say that. Mm. I'm saying that these are the things we are all picking on the ground. I don't have any concrete evidence to say that it is true or not. But the point I'm making fundamentally is that the decision and the action of these 40 MPs was wrong, was unacceptable. It was a betrayal of a decision that was taken by the party. And to the extent that you are not an independent candidate and that you are there on the ticket of NDC and your constituents and your constituents have said so loudly that they don't want us to approve of these ministers, you have no business to go and approve of that, uh, the, the, the ministers and come and justify your decision. And that is why I think, well, this thing is becoming one too many. Honestly, this is becoming one too many. There are several votes apart from maybe uh, the speaker's election that took place in parliament. Almost every other thing that we have stood against. Look at the, even the veteran of the uh, earlier minister, the Hawa Yakubus and Kojo Pongruma, our initial decision. You mean Mavis Hawa Kubusen? Uh, uh, that's right, the minister of uh, fishes, right? Right. You know, uh, earlier on we said that we're not going to approve of these persons. But at the end of the day, they almost all, all of them went through. In this particular case, too, look at even the judges and all that. All right, point so, made. That is why I'm saying that the party, we need to get to the bottom of this particular issue. Some investigation needs to be instituted into this issue. Let's go deep down there. If we can get one or two persons, perhaps with them as a scapegoat, that will serve as a deterrent. Everybody right. now sit up that, hey, 
The past is bigger than all of us. And the past has given all of us the platform to operate on. And so you cannot say, I am independent-minded and I will do just what I want. Let me bring in uh, Professor John Gachi. He is a lecturer at the University of Cape Coast. He is dean of the School of Business. Yes, we're going to be talking about the, the political dynamics and the IMF deal. But uh, basically, Mr. Agbanyo in the studio is suggesting that the NDC is mother party. They suckle these MPs and you do not cut... Uh, the hand that gives you bread. So when the party says jump, you must jump. Do you agree with this stance? That's what political parties do. They have interest in every issue that come up and they express their interest and how their members ought to vote to reflect that interest. Uh, it is only that at this point in time, uh, the expression of their interest did not find favor uh, in the sight of a number of the MPs, so they didn't vote in line. Mm. And that does not mean that the MPs are not important. That does not mean that the MPs will not carry business in the larger interests of the party. And therefore, the call for uh, doing something so serious against the MPs, uh, I don't think may arise. Uh, what the MPs Do you think it's justified, that call for punitive measures? Is that call justified? Well, uh, it depends on the reflection of the party. Uh, it is coming from a deeper disappointment of the rank and file of the party, and that find the expression in that way. And I believe by now, uh, some of the people who voted uh, uh, that way uh, may have considered their decision and may have told themselves that going forward they want to stand by the party. So I think that is how it should be looked at so that uh, they don't muddy the waters and create deeper crack uh, within their rank as they go into parliamentary elections and as they go into the general election. Uh, again, um, if care is not taken, some of the very good MPs uh, may suffer some exit as a result of this. So I believe it ought to be handled well. Safe to say that uh, I think there is one aspect that we are not looking at. Uh, it's a secret vote. And uh, what that means is that it is also possible that one, some of the MPs from the side of the MPP would have also voted against. We actually and brought that up in our last conversation, but obviously it would also mean that more of those who are supposed exactly, to be against exactly. voted that is, for. That's the point I'm making. Mm. So they, they should also look at the matter deeper and not only on the surface that, okay, 31 people voted against. No, it could be 50, it could be 60, depending on the number of people on the side of the MPP who voted against. But as the discussion focused on the NDC, uh, I think we lost sight of whether or not some people voted against uh, from the MPP side. Mm. Does this, is, is this an indictment on the leadership of the NDC, whether administratively or in Parliament? And it comes up because the NDC has reshuffled its leadership in Parliament uh, very recently. So people will definitely ask the questions, which they have on social media and beyond. Does that mean that uh, the new leadership of the party is not able to keep uh, the members of parliament in line, uh, so to speak? Well, I think what it calls for is that the parties should engage in deeper research to really appreciate what actually happened. Is it the weight of a personal relationship that carried the day? Uh, is it family ties? Is it <laughs> belonging to the same church, etc., that carries the day? Uh, so I think that reflection ought to be done and not merely about the failure. I think the party has failed in this uh, uh, voting, but the contribution of the MPs uh, at large has not failed the party. And that is what the party ought to consider. And I also believe that uh, the old executive and uh, those who might have voted uh, against the, the will of the party are so mature that I'm not sure they want to pay the party back 
uh, uh, for not uh, acceding to their wishes to maintain the old executive. That would have been immature uh, for them to do. Uh, so I think that is why uh, broader reflection uh, and open-minded uh, research ought to be conducted to know why that happened. And going forward, uh, they will be able to deal with matters as, uh, uh, as, uh, as, as, as much as possible. Mm. And again, I, I also believe uh, that uh, some of the issues ought to be dealt with in-house. Um, you have whipped up the interests of Ghanaians at large that you are able uh, to uh, vote in a particular way. That will, will reflect the interests of Ghanaians and Ghanaians rally behind you. Uh, only to see this result, you have not only disappointed the party, you have disappointed Ghanaians. So the party ought to be mindful as to when and how they should keep up the interests of Ghanaians behind them. Uh, if not so, uh, the interests of Ghanaians may be winning uh, against the call by the party. Before we get into the economic <laughs> dynamics and the IMF and all of that, let me come back into the studio. I want us to wrap with what has been going on within the NDC. You've also been vetting your aspirants and all of that. What has that process been like so far? Well, so far it's going very well. Uh, President Mahama appeared before the vetting committee on Monday and uh, he went through the process successfully. Uh, my understanding uh, is that uh, Dr. Uh, Dufour also appeared yesterday. Uh, I'm not too sure it's going to appear today. Uh, originally, it was uh, the parliamentary aspirants who were supposed to have gone to the vetting starting from yesterday, but that has been rescheduled to next week from third. And so, so far, uh, the information I pick is that everything is going on very well. Uh, President Mahama has since been on the campaign tour uh, of the country, trying to engage all, all the delegates in the various countries. He started off yesterday from the central region, I think from Kaswa area. And uh, the signal and the pictures are picking is that overwhelmingly uh, NDC members uh, are rallied behind them. And I have said that uh, all the persons who have expressed interest and who want to contest as flag bearer of our party are all very qualified. But where we are now as a political party, if indeed it is power we want in 2024, there's only one person who can lead us to that power, and that person is none other than uh, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. Uh, so Isn't I, it problematic that your party is already de facto, it appears one person is in a comfortable lead, uh, uh, and, and that many of you, uh, both members of parliament and leadership of the parties, appear to be leaning towards him when the democratic pact, uh, process where delegates will vote has not even taken place. Well, I don't think that nobody is halting the process. The process is still ongoing, but the party constitution or the guidelines for that matter does not stop any individual from declaring support for any particular candidate. I have decided to declare my support for John Dramani Mahama, and that's why I'm talking about it openly. Uh, what we have said is that, is that as a body, for instance, we cannot say that all national executive uh, committee, we are supporting one particular candidate. We cannot say that the parliamentary caucus is supporting a particular candidate or the whole region. But individuals within the party, uh, regardless the level that you operate from, you can choose to support what you want to support. And I am saying that if you engage the rank and file of our party people, if you engage the Ghanaian people, this is a man who has done it before. The evidence is there, his work is there for all to see. And so everywhere you pass, everybody thinks that he must return to come and finish uh, the job he didn't, he didn't finish. So for me, I, I think that overwhelmingly we should go and support him, we should rally around him. I don't expect him to get anything less than 98% uh, in the primaries come 13th May. Anything less than what, 98%? 98% so? of the votes. I don't expect to get anything less than that. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, only time will tell on these matters. Uh, I always keep in mind what uh, Sir John of blessed memory uh, no, said. No, 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 not in this case. Unless, of course, we don't want power. And I believe that everybody in this country, including uh, uh, even your very self, you wanted this to return to power. Your very self would see President Mahama. Uh, oh, uh, did did you just suggest? That, did Professor, you just suggest that <laughs> I wanted Gashi, you to? You, you do not know that. You, 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 no, 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 no. I, no. I, 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 I take exception to that. I don't know about uh, Professor. Gashi, Why are you taking exception? No, you, are you comfortable with what you, we are now? I, the fact that I am not comfortable yeah. does not necessarily mean that. Yeah. I, you know, we've created a two-horse race in this country, and we feel that oh, 
and it plays into the hands of the politicians. Oh, even if I do not perform, I'm eh, no, not, I, I, I not part of that. No, not uh, necessarily, but the point is that you know, what option control. do we have currently? We don't have any other option. Is that our end is your MPP? Left okay. to me, le left to me, let me say this publicly. I, I do wish we had, for, for different reasons, you know, even in uh, business, if you are a monopoly, it's always problematic. That's if right. it's a duopoly, that's right. it's still problematic. Mm. But when there are many powers, then look at what is happening in Israel the best. And, and the checks and the balances. So I, I will tell you here and now that I do wish there were that third force to keep both your parties in, in, you know, on its toes. Unfortunately, we don't have that. No, so, to be honest and, with and that you, makes it's, it it's a position I also agree with. I, and I've said that you know, openly several times, that I wish that we have a third political force, even a fourth political force in this country that will put both of us on our toes. Because sometimes, like you rightly said, uh, some members may think that, well, if MPP doesn't perform, automatically NDC will come. And so it's just, you know, like... It's like a fan belt. Uh, it's a fan it. belt. It lets, <laughs> so I, I, it's a position I also hold that we need to take Ghanaians more serious when we are given the opportunity to serve. It is because they have a need, just that they have given the opportunity. And so we must be seen delivering on the things that we, we said when we're campaigning. And so I agree. But the point I'm making is that where we sit now, we don't have any third third force, we don't have a fourth force. The only thing we have, and the statistics shows that President Mohammed and John the NDC perform far, far, far better than this government in spite of all the resources that they have gotten in the past six to seven years. And that is why everybody thinks that NDC is a better manager of this economy, President Mahama is a better president, and so he should return and come in and complete his work. Let's, let's talk about the economy now. You started off by talking about the economy and the challenges we are facing. But let me come to you, Professor Gachi. Uh, there are two crucial issues I want us to uh, take a look at. One has to do with the bills before our members of parliament, whether they approve it or not. And again, I guess it's going to be another test for the minority in parliament. But even before that, in terms of the IMF deal, we've also heard Information Minister Kojo Ponkroma talk about the fact that China now, and there have been some comments from the Chinese end, together with the Paris Club, are willing to aid us cross that line, get to sustainable economic levels, sustainable debt levels, so we can secure an IMF deal. Indeed, upon reflection, the, the bills which have been touted as going to be able to give us that final push to cross the line for an IMF deal maybe should come first. What do you make of the growth and sustainability bill, uh, regardless of all the other additional names, the excise duty, and those three bills that are set to go before Parliament for consideration, uh, which the President very much would uh, give us assent to? To become law. What do you make of them? What is the reality of them in these economic times, Professor Gachi? Okay, thank you. I think there is a common reason why uh, laws are made, and, in, and for that matter, um, promulgating law regarding uh, fiscal measures. Uh, by, by the close of last year, we were told that we need to increase VAT to increase revenue. We need to remove benchmark value from the port to increase revenue. And by that, we will be meeting the IMF uh, preconditions uh, to engage. By January this year, that was done. Uh, that has possibility of pushing up prices of all goods and services uh, in the country. Uh, we have done debt exchange program domestically, and today we are saying, I think not by me, by the Bank of Ghana governor, that the debt, the domestic debt exchange program has affected a number of banks, and to the extent that he's calling for uh, a capital recapitalization, uh, plan, a recapitalization plan. Uh, so if you have done that. The environment you have created is hostile for businesses. Now you are talking about 5% uh, le stabilization levy, growth and stabilization levy on a bank which is about to die. I don't, I don't find that reason comfortable. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't get what we are doing just to sa satisfy IMF. That's not how you introduce taxes. You introduce taxes to balance the need to raise revenue 
and they need to provide an environment for the businesses to thrive. And we have forgotten about that altogether. All that we want is the IMF says we need to get more revenue. So we have introduced VAT, we have removed uh, benchmark value, it's not sufficient. We want to bring more. So that is the reason why these things are, are happening. And then we are not analyzing the effect of that on businesses. Businesses are dying. The SMEs are becoming indebted to the banks over and over again because they cannot just pay 40% interest rate and then with all these taxes around it. It is just not a good environment we are creating. So I think uh, <laughs> passing these laws would deepen the, the burden and the problem that the business environment is going through. It's just going to deepen the woes of the business community as far as you see it. Exactly so. Exactly so. What would be your alternatives? Well, the alternative has been clear from day one. The alternative is that even if you increase taxes by 100%, and expenditure is not aligned with taxes or the revenue, you will still be in need of more money. So expenditure alignment, and then we, we call something productive expenditure. We need to engage in productive expenditure. We have engaged in a lot of unproductive expenditure, inefficient expenditure. So that is the best solution for us. So that when that is done, we may be aligning our taxes uh, with um, uh, our expenditure, but we have not done that. We are not even ready, even in this time, we are not ready just as all of us do at, uh, in our homes uh, and in our businesses that I'm doing a project this time, but things are difficult. Let me hold on for let's say one year and resume. We don't want to hear that. We still want to keep agenda 111 on, on the budget. We still want to, to, uh, to keep all the things we are doing uh, uh, on the budget. That is not how it is done. So in this time, our budget is not a reflection of our situation. It's something way above what we claim we are suffering. So that is the surest alternative. Uh, just before we, we take leave of you, two, two quick points. How soon do you feel we could secure a program uh, from the IMF? Promises have been made first quarter, then it was pushed to March. And now, uh, as has been mentioned, we are not going to meet that March deadline. Should we still prognosticate, so to speak? Uh, what would be your timelines? Do you feel within the next... Uh, quarter, we would be able to secure that deal as March comes to an end. And uh, finally, I'd like you to share your thoughts, since you would have to take leave of us, of that issue that has stoked a lot of commentary on social media. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris talking about LGBTQ and the response of Mr. President. What's your take? So two quick issues to wrap with us. Yes, um, I, I think... The insistence on an IMF program at the end of March was deliberate uh, so that if we don't get it, then there is some kind of moral pressure on the Ghanaian society that it because we have not been able to pass these uh, uh, bills. That is the reason why we couldn't get it. So we need to do very fast to get this, so, uh, uh, this bill passed. Then we can get the IMF program. So I consider it to be deliberate, but because there is every sign clear to the president and the finance minister that we can't get an IMF deal by the close of uh, March. Uh, well, uh, from all indications, uh, given that all the international creditors have agreed to support Ghana, they will then have a meeting in April. Now, when that meeting uh, is held in April, then it is either from April or May that a deal may be clinched. So uh, I, I consider this deal may happen either by the close of April or, uh, or May. That is given that our parliament is able to pass these bills, uh, which I do not encourage 
uh, them to do because we have passed so many fiscal bills already and that is creating uh, an easy environment for businesses. Now, coming to LGBTQ, uh, I think the position of the Vice President of uh, the US is not a reflection of the generality of the Ghanaian society, uh, but we do not know the stand of our government. There is a bill in parliament uh, against those values. Uh, I think we need to wait to see whether parliament uh, would be convinced to go on the side of the US or to go on the side of a reflection of the general uh, um, uh, value system of, of, of the Ghanaian people. I think that is what I, I need to say. But uh, what it also means that all the promises that the US Vice President is making is likely to be linked to uh, compliance with creating an avenue for LGBTQ uh, in Ghana. So those monies may, may not come unless uh, something is done to deeper uh, LGBT acceptance and uh, uh, freedoms in, in, in Ghana. Prof, we're grateful that you, you made the time to join us this morning. Uh, you have to run off, but uh, we're very grateful that you took the time. Professor John Gachi is a lecturer at the University of Cape Coast. He is dean of the UCC School of Business. He joined us for that conversation. Let me come to you, Fred. I'll give you time later on to talk about the LGBT bid, but let's stay on your party. Those three bills, that was where I started off the conversation with Prof. Um, the business community, all of those I've interacted with, the Chamber of Commerce, Guta, ordinary business people, I've all said this is going to wreak even more havoc on businesses, on our economy, and even the purchasing power of the ordinary Ghanaian to purchase our products. Yesterday, there was something that uh, a friend of mine had asked me to check on sometime last year. If you look at the difference in price currently, it's, it's shocking. Because the product finally arrived per this person who brings the products into the country. And so the person reached back to me that, oh, it has arrived. And I asked, how much is it? And the person told me. And I relayed the info. I was in shock. So I just relayed the information to the other person. The amount that has been added on just because of our currency issues is maddening. I get that. But like we keep saying, your end in Parliament is also not living up to expectation in terms of dealing with the critical issues that the masses want you to deal with. So my question to you, Fred, these three bills are set to go before Parliament. Can we, I don't know whether to say for once, trust, count on the NDC minority to maybe, not, not for me, but for the business community, those we've spoken to, to do what is needed in terms of stymieing these bills. Can we count on the NDC to do that? My, my, my brother, is when I first described the state of our economy, you created the impression I was deliberately or doing the usual politicking by creating a very gloomy picture. I wasn't. Sometimes, but, let, let me just make this clear. Sometimes <laughs> what uh, politicians don't understand when they come on this show is, Regardless of my personal sentiment, of course I agree. As a journalist, right. I have to probe every matter I incisively, I agree. I agree. I agree. even if I agree with you. I have to probe it incisively and and ensure that both sides are represented. You are, you are, you are right. You are right. <laughs> I agree. You are doing your job as a journalist, but I am making that point to 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 drum home the fact that our situation is very dire. Where we are now, our president, our government has become a zombie government. Somebody sits in New York in the name of IMF and say, go and task your people. Then say, yes, sir. Then they quickly put a bill together, take to parliament, and then they want to stampede everybody to pass it. Meanwhile, you live with us in this country. And then you know the living conditions of the people of the country. And so you don't need anybody from New York to come and tell you, go and task your people where you know very well that the people don't have what it takes to pay those taxes. My brother, I'm happy that you have spoken to 
business owners in this country. And you yourself have con just confirmed on set that things people are going through to manage a small business in Ghana today is not a joke. Price of electricity, price of water, fuel, cost of labor. See, it's as if you are better off keeping your money under your bed and allow the inflation to eat it away than to say you are going to put your money in any form of investment so you can help the government by creating more, you know, jobs for the people. I dare say if you go to America, they pay a lot of taxes. If you go to anywhere in Europe, they pay taxes. But when you go there, you see evidence of the tax they are paying. Go and check the rent, uh, lending rates from their banks. Today in Ghana, here to assess a bank loan, my brother, you are paying almost 40%. They will tell you on paper, oh, it's 30 something percent. By the time you pay all those administrative costs and the rest, you are over 40%. Which business are you going to run with 40% uh, 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 interest rates on borrowing and make a profit? Look at electricity, as I said, water, everything. And so if the government sleeps and wakes up and a boss called an IMF has said, go and increase, uh, increase new, uh, introduce new taxes. And so they flash the parliament to go and list some bills. And by Friday, the Minister of Information has the audacity to call on Ghanaians to support them. We were here when they said they were bringing E-Levy. And they told us E-Levy is the panacea of our problems. And once they introduce the E-Levy, everything will be solved in this country. We were told if you want our road fees, pass the E-Levy. If you want water fees, pass the E-Levy. If you want employment, pass E-Levy. Is it a year ago that we passed the E-Levy? And what has happened to that E-Levy? That you are back telling us that we should agree to pass three new taxes. And I was supposed to pay for it. What has happened to the salaries of teachers? What has happened to the salaries of nurses? The, 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 the truck truck driver who barely makes sales a day. The journalist, the media man, the camera, how much are you earning? And so one day, if the boss of this company gets up and says, you know what, I'm going to cut the workers here by half. Do you blame him? And so it's as if the government is so insensitive, the government is so detached from the realities on the ground. I am using this platform to call on the NDC members of parliament. We empathize with the brief family of the MP that passed, the Kumewe MP that passed away yesterday. Right. We, we, all of us, we, we, we pray that God touch the hearts of the, the, the brief family. But the reality to that we speak is that MPP can no longer describe itself as a majority side in parliament. We have the numbers. Stand to be counted. Make sure this bill doesn't go through. You're now encouraging. You're, sound, you're sounding like a preacher, a motivational speaker. I am speaker. not. I thought after what had happened on Friday, you would be categorical and say, we are going to vote massively against this. It appears now you've, the party has toned down on the back of what happened on it, Friday. It's not you, sat, you, you suddenly realize that, oh, we can't actually determine how these MPs vote. You see, you see the, the actions and inactions of this, some of these MPs could affect the entire party and the whole country. If they go and pass this bill and businesses fold up and unemployment is created in the country, unemployment, hardship will lead to insecurity and what have you. And that is why we think that where we are now, we simply cannot pay, Mr. President. Mr. President and this government, you have received so much money that if you are prudent, if you care about this country, by now, you should rather be giving us free bills. Not to be taken away from answers we don't have. Right. Let's, let's cap off the conversation on the LGBTQI plus saga. It comes, it goes, we have that bill in Parliament. And in her speech, Kamala Harris, the, the US Vice President, had something to say about our freedoms and the LGBTQ community. We've seen what has happened in Uganda. Some say that should happen here. 
But hold your horses. Is that what we need? Is that not what we need? Do we have the proper legislation already? Do we need the bill? Don't we need the bill? We heard Speaker of Parliament Alban Bagman, and this morning, if you followed our news, we played that clip, speak vociferously on the matter, on his stance. And he stated that the bill would pass. But when backed to the wall, so to speak, what did our president have to say before I come to Fred Agbenyo? Let's listen to what President Nanado Dankwa Gofuado had to say. I'll start. Uh, I have raised this issue, and let me be clear about where we stand. First of all, for the American press who are here, you know that a great deal of, of work in my career has been to address human rights issues, equality issues across the board, including as it relates to the LGBT community. And I feel very strongly about the importance of supporting uh, the, the, the freedom and, and supporting and fighting for equality among all people and that all people be treated equally. I will also say that uh, this is an issue that we consider and I consider to be a human rights issue and that will not change. Um, yes, what's the name? Kano Young, so the New York Times. Zonan. Mr. Young, so thank you for the question. First of all, we don't have any such legislation here in Ghana. A bill has been proposed to the Parliament of Ghana, which has all kinds of ramifications, which is now being considered by the Parliament. It hasn't been passed, so the statement that there is legislation in Ghana to that effect is not accurate. The bill is going through the Parliament. It's going through the Parliament. The Attorney General has found it necessary to speak to the committee about it regarding the constitutionality or otherwise of several of its provisions, and the Parliament is dealing with it. The, at the end of the process, I will come in. But in the, in the meantime, the Parliament is dealing with it. And I have no doubt that the Parliament of Ghana will show, as it has done in the past, one, first of all, its sensitivity to human rights issues, as well as to the feelings of our population, and will come out with a responsible response to the, to, to the proposed. The legislation was a legislation that has been provided provi as a private member's bill. This is not an official legislation of the government, but it is one that has been, uh, been mooted by a handful of private members. So we will see what the final outcome of it. But I'm, uh, my understanding from the recent of the committee, the substantial elements of the bill have already been modified as a result of the intervention of the Attorney General. We will see what the final outcome will be, and that is the stage at which I will also have the opportunity to prevent. As far as the presence of, of Wagner is concerned, we're concerned about it. We may so we've heard from Mr. President, from the horse's own mouth, uh, literally speaking. He speaks uh, about modifications that, you know, uh, are going on as far as the bill is concerned. But I found it interesting what he makes mention of. At the end of the process, I will come in. There is also uh, the Speaker of Parliament who has said categorically, this bill will pass. And it will go to Mr. President and almost suggesting at the end that Mr. President will have no choice. Is this going to be some kind of war, so to speak, between number one and number three, <laughs> as the speaker has. Anyway, over to you. What, what do you make of what Vice President Kamala Harris said and the response of Mr. President? See, I think that the West has a responsibility to take us a bit more serious and know that we are a sovereign country, that we have our own values, we have our own culture that on any day we will not compromise on. If it means that we will starve to death, I think that when it comes to issues like this, the larger Ghanaian society will choose an option than to bow to the whims and caprices of any so-called powers that be. We are very clear in our minds. If it means that they are going to deny us all the support, whatever it is, Ghanaians, I don't believe, are ready to compromise 
on this particular principle, our value. But we cannot go to America. Let me ask we you, which, 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 which values? What, what do you describe as human right? That I must ignore these very beautiful succulent ladies around and go chasing some hard butters guy, and that is a right? What are you talking about? Mm. It's sickening, right? Is that a right? All these beautiful ladies around, they don't attract you, right? So why do you need this one? For the Absolutely. proponents, they will tell you it's a matter of choice, but just as choice. someone would. For the proponents, they will tell you it's a matter of choice. So let that choice be in your bedroom. Really? Don't impose that choice on the, the Ghanaian society. Mm. We have things that concern us that we want America and the rest to come and help us to solve. Help us to fix our rules. Help us to fill our educational system, our health system. Help us to create employment for our people. Help us to do things that will live our, our lives as, as human beings. Mm. These are not the things we want to talk about. People are looking for water to drink. People are looking for food to eat three times in a day. Mm. These are the things that we are interested you in. You do realize that uh, those, while many people may not support some of these, you do realize that these people, so to speak, in the LGBTQI community, QI plus community, are also citizens. They also have rights. And that eh, there's an interesting picture when sometimes you look at the law that just as the law legislates that maybe do X, it also has its biases against Y. So in, in adherence to the law, if someone within the confines of the law, depending on how uh, the law restricts it, says, I want to do Y instead of X. And if it's not technically legal, which may be what uh, may be backing this bill, they also have rights, don't they? You see, if you go and read the literature on the history of this whole thing, even out there. Mention it by its name, LGBTQ. I don't want to talk about it that way. If, you know, even out there, they saw it as a mental issue, as a health issue, as a disease. Mm. I don't know at what point it became a human right issue. All right. At what point? I think as, 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 uh, as then, early as 2008, 2010, there were court uh, decisions in the UK. I remember there was, there was an issue with uh, someone who had um, had some sort of, I think, sex change or something of the sort. And the court had said that the person still had his gonads, the male... Mm you know, the testes mm. and the rest, and so that person was male. I mean, from that point, you would see a certain trajectory. You're asking about timing. I'm just reflecting yes. yeah, but on hi historical, is, can, you know, can, can we antecedents and how we, we, see, we got here. When you go to these countries, right, education is not their problem again. Health is not their problem again. Mm. They're not battling with water to drink. As far, they, they've built those things. Please, we, don't, we are not interested in this subject at this point. Now, I think that our president... President Nanado Dangwa Kufuado is becoming a burden to this country. He's becoming a problem. He's very posturing on this subject from the word go. When he first granted an interview to, I think, BBC, and said he believes not many people are making noise in Ghana. The noise level is so low, and that is why it's not becoming an issue. And I, I thought that that statement was problematic. Now, two days ago, or was it yesterday, you stood before the American vice president, and you against that, well, this bill that is in parliament right now is just a private member bill. It's just a few people who are pushing this. This is an official bill. What is the president saying? Now, when the president concludes by saying that when all is said and done in Parliament, the bar stops with him. It will come to his attention. What is he saying? That when Parliament passes it, you will not assent to it? Is that what he's saying? You see, I don't blame anybody. I mean, just to, just to interrupt ah, briefly, that, okay. that, that could... It, it would be interesting seeing how this... I, I, as a student of law, I would love to see... I'm excited about such issues because I'd like to see... To push the system and ha see how the system responds. But it also reminds me of, is it Article 45 or 49? I, I forget. In France, mm. you see the tool that President Macron has used in terms of elevating the, 
the, the age for pension from 62 mm. to 64 mm. and the backlash mm. and everything that has mm. happened. Uh, for, for me, uh, from, from that scholarly standpoint, sometimes I like to see what will happen, especially as uh, Mr. President Not has come out saying like at the end of all of it, it will come to him and uh, he would have to decide in the end, put pen to paper. You see, I, I was going to conclude by saying that the problem of a society is our collective hypocrisy. Collective hypocrisy. That's right. That is a problem of the Ghanaian society. That when it matters most, the voices that must be heard, for whatever reason, goes to sleep. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, zips up. And so then, we have a few people trying to show us that, hey, we are who we are. For Christ's sake, right from the president to the least president in this country, you are just one man. Nobody's bigger than Ghana. But, but, but we, as we talk of that, so, so, some, 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 some people will tell you, yes, we agree with you, but as we say in Chi, we need veranda. You don't even have a veranda. And you say you'll keep, you know, why don't you have a veranda? In which, in which space? And, and, and why are we going to the IMF? You see, my brother. My so brother. some would tell you that, look, yes, we may even side with you, but let's stop all the rhetoric because uh, these are the same countries you go pan in hand, begging. You can't go and do toboy toboy when your paymasters, so to speak, uh, tell you what to do. In fact, this morning I was raising the point while interacting with Dr. Kwame Asasanti. The West would often not go to the Gulf countries or the Arabian countries, oil rich, independent in the true sense of the word and all of that, with some of this rhetoric. Others make that point. But some would say that you, you have all the resources, but you have nothing. You're always begging. So keep quiet and you swallow say, it. How do you react we, to that? Who do we blame? We blame the political elite. We blame people who have been in leadership since independent. We blame the people that the Ghanaian people have entrusted the destiny of the country into their hands. Otherwise, Ghana is not a poor country that we have to be running around the world begging everybody for survival so they can look us in the face and tell us what they, what they want. But because we have refused to manage the free gifts that God has given to us, a country blessed with oil, diamond, gold, everything you can think of, you know, arable land, river body, sunshine, what do you want to develop and be an independent country in, in, in its true sense? Our policy, our, our foreign policy has always been non-alliance. Why? As you rightly said, if you cannot go to the Gulf regions and go and tell them these things, why do you think you can come to us and come and tell us these things? Do you know what human rights abuse is? Do you know what happens in America every day? The people whose rights have been abused in America every day. And that one is not a subject to be discussed. Because the media will never put that one out, they will concede it. They will show to us only the things they want us to see and know. I think that, you see, as I said, our problem is because we are hypocrites. We don't speak the truth. That is our problem in this country. If all of us are ready to speak the truth and, and stand by the truth and die by the truth, some of these things that we are experiencing, some of these things that are going on, definitely will not happen. But because we are refusing to do it. You see, Vice President, please, we beg you. We, we, we have our own challenges. This morning, some children are more nourished. A few weeks ago, we didn't have common vaccines. As we speak to you, pensioners cannot even buy pharmaceutical products. Go and check the price of maybe a, a BP drug that a few months ago was less than 50 Ghana cities to go to the same counter and go and check the price. These are the things Ghanaians want to see. Mm. This is the conversation we want to have with you. If indeed you have us at heart and you want to see this country develop, these are the things we want to discuss. Fred, uh, we're grateful that you took the time to join us this morning. It's, it's a good you, having man. you. I don't think, we've, we've not had you on the show in a long time, so yeah, it's yeah, refreshing yes. that you took the time to join us this morning. I think that the whole of this Fred, year is the first time I've been on indeed, set. I've, indeed. Been, I've been the Republic of uh, uh, Guam. Uh, <laughs> maybe right before we, I cross over to my colleague, Bernice, uh, on the political you know, spectrum, what are you hoping, what are you looking ahead? Personally? Yes. 
Yes, I'm praying that when the seat is eventually, constituency is eventually created. Which seat? The, the South, South one constituency. I want to run for San that. Kofi, Akpafu, Likwe, Lolobi. That's right, that's right. So right. I've been there working very hard. I want to get opportunity to represent those people. And uh, so far, uh, it's been very, very, very good. I've received so much support from them. And uh, I think that the opportunity will come and I'll, I'll grab it. There was talk that uh, Fred Nyama would go for Ayawasu West Wogon. There's talk that John Dumele will go back. So Fred may, may just come and contest you. Who is Fred? Fred Nyama. Oh, is he from that place? Uh, well, there was talk about the fact that he would go for this or go for that one. Well, I don't know. I know about Fred Agbenyo. <laughs> I don't know okay. where he's coming. <laughs> All right. Fred, thank you so much. Thank Fred you, my brother. Agbenyo is yeah. a Deputy Director of International Affairs with the NDC. Earlier, we had Professor John Gachi, who is a Dean of the UCC School of Business. For all of you who have been watching, thank you. But don't...